For a lot of you that aren't really familiar with what the developer platform arm of these companies does, it mostly focuses on the external API and the developer tooling and the outreach and the partner integration sometimes and um, sometimes product focused SDKs and oftentimes helping a lot with the open source work that's going on. Um, and I want to talk to you a bit about today about some of the features and experiences I've had at these different companies and what they've kind of taught me about building out these platforms on, on mobile and Android specifically. Uh, and then um, hopefully those learnings will help you guys uh, figure out when a better understanding when you're integrating against these or provide some guidance when you're wanting to build your own platforms. Uh, so a, a traditional approach on mobile may look uh, pretty similar to this. You have your web service running in the cloud and you have a bunch of different devices and on each device you may have a bunch of different apps and each one of them bundles an SDK or a library that uh, connects up to your service. They have duplicate data potentially that's coming down if you're caching data. They might be making similar network requests. Um, there's duplicate code across the devices. These are all sandboxed individually. And I think a more interesting approach on Android is when you start to treat like the proprietary main application as a provider of some of that data or some of those interesting use cases, much like the web services treated in the previous example. Um, so I'll walk you through a few examples uh, in some projects where I've built out some similar stuff to this, where you have one app, uh, you know, the Evernote app, the Uber app, and um, some things with, with Twitter and Fabric, where that became the provider of these use cases, and other apps on the device talk to it instead. Uh, a recent project that I worked on, and excuse the uh, crappy video, capturing video on Android is, was not treating me well this day. Um, but a recent project that I worked on was uh, adding and, and rewriting some of the deep linking code in the rewrite of the Uber app. Um, and for those of you not super familiar with like deep linking specifically, it's a pretty general term that's used in mobile just to kind of define uh, the use case of using a URI just a standard web URI uh, that an app can handle. And in this case, um, this one that we're going to be talking about is the user clicking on a deep link and initiating a ride request for them from a, a pickup to a destination spot and potentially adding in some details for the ride, like the type of car that they want. Um, the URI itself is uh, just kind of a quick overview. It's just using the standard uh, scheme where, where we have the scheme that defines um, what the app is registered to handle, uh, potentially an authority. In this case, we're using ride requests to indicate the action that we want to perform. And then we don't really have any need for a path on this one, but uh, we're using the query parameter to indicate a bunch of this additional data that's going to be coming across, uh, like the pickup Latin long. Uh, there's quite a number of other, uh, quite a number of them, and they're documented on our dev site. Um, but for this example, that's uh, all that's really necessary to talk about. And then in Android, in the Uber app itself, we register to handle that deep link in our manifest. Now, what's interesting in this case is you could just use the scheme here with Uber to handle all incoming Uber schemed URIs, but I'd recommend being a little more explicit so that you're not capturing everything uh, that could possibly be handled. In this one example here, we're, we're uh, using ride request activity. And so we've explicitly set the authority that we're looking for in the URI to be ride request. Uh, so this specific intent filter wouldn't necessarily capture uh, other Uber schemed URIs that are intended for other, uh, other actions to be handled. Now this, this isn't the actual implementation in the Uber app. We actually do have one specific scheme and then we are kind of wrap those out. But uh, if your app is not single activity, then I'd recommend um, thinking about how to limit the scoping. Uh, but since deep links are kind of this general term that's used across just mobile in general uh, and the web, uh, it's more common to think of them as just like a standard HTTP link that the application can handle. And that the same data can be provided using an HTTP link um, that, that Android is registered to handle. So this is where you get the concept of universal links. But what I think is interesting in handling these is what happens when the application is not installed on the device. And because we're using a standard HTTP URL, 
if the app is not installed, the system is going to take the user uh, to, to your website, right? That just HTTP link that we had listed in the previous example. And a uh, common way that this is done in the industry, uh, if you're looking at some of the third-party providers like Branch or uh, custom implementations, is you'll have your site that they're hitting uh, use the device's user agent and some of the uh, web APIs to create a fingerprint for the device. And then they're going to forward that device in the browser onto a redirect URI uh, that's the Play Store. If it's on iOS, it's going to go to the App Store. Um, but it's going to include a refer query parameter with some sort of identifier. So this, uh, if you were using something for affiliation like branch or tune, uh, that might be a unique ID that you can access later to, to get the deep link that originally started it to continue the flow. If you wanted to do a custom implementation, you could just URL encode the original deep link that the user fired to come in here. Uh, but in this case, after we go to the Play Store and we provide that information in the refer parameter, uh, ideally, the customer installs the application. And then when that's launched, the Play Store is going to emit a uh, broadcast to your app. So if you're registered to handle uh, that broadcast, then you can get the information uh, about the referrer that installed the application. That's the install referrer broadcast. Uh, once we have that, we can look at the intent, look at the value uh, for that referrer parameter. And if that was just a URL encoded deep link to start it, then you could uh, immediately act on that. And so the user going from clicking the link to install to opening would continue the flow that they originally started by clicking it. Now, if it was something like uh, a unique ID that was being used with, with Tune or with Branch or one of the other third party services, that will uh, then query their service for that ID that was generated based on the fingerprint and uh, collect the information from their server, what the original URL was, so that you can also continue the flow. Now, um, that's kind of like the long route that's a little more interesting. Using that universal link, uh, if the user just clicks on it and the app is installed, then by default on Android, uh, it's going to prompt the user to pick between the, uh, your app that's registered to handle it and potentially the browser. So if the user clicks on your app, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. If they click on the browser, it kind of loses some of the assumptions that the app isn't installed. So you may often see use cases where that happens and you still get forwarded to the Play Store. But with uh, Android Marshmallow and up, Google introduced this concept of app linking. And app linking is this idea that instead of bringing up the uh, intent picker for that URL, then both your app can handle and Chrome can handle the browser or the, the URL as well. It says, hey, uh, system, I am the official owner, uh, I'm the official application that owns this domain, and I should be the default one to handle this. Don't prompt the user to go to Chrome or other third party apps that are installed. And I think this provides a better user experience and uh, an enhanced security model as well, so that the, uh, you don't potentially have a malicious app uh, on the device that could intercept information, especially if it was sensitive in the URI. Uh, if we wanted to implement app linking, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we would need to add this auto verify tag to our intent filter. And this tells the Android system to look over your manifest, look for any intent filters that you have defined, and then go query against the domain that you might have registered here. Uh, this should be the HTTP scheme that we have defined here, not the Uber one in this example. Um, and then on your web service, you would need to use the key tool to grab the public fingerprint from your key store or from uh, a key store signed APK. And then you would want to put a JSON file called assets, assetlinks.json up on your primary domain. And that in, contains the fingerprint that you retrieved. Now, uh, when the system sees that auto verify tag, it's going to take the public fingerprint from your APK, and it's going to match that up against the one that's on your domain that's listed here in the assets link.json. And that'll uh, give the system uh, confidence that you are the real owner of that and you can handle it. You can also uh, put multiple fingerprints in here if you have multiple apps as well. Another common mobile platform a developer platform feature is authentication. Uh, and that's usually used to call an authenticated endpoint where you needed OAuth 
tokens or, or another type of access token to get at. Uh, the Uber API has both privileged and non-privileged scopes, depending on the impact of the API. Uh, if you were just wanting to do a, write a request estimate, for example, that would be non-privileged. But if you wanted to initiate the, uh, the trip for the user that's going to actually cause a car to show up to their current location and charge them money, then that's a privileged scope. Um, the using, getting non-privileged access tokens is a little easier of an implementation. You could do that straight with OAuth and a client ID. If you were wanting to get it a privileged scope, uh, it, it'd require a little more of a configuration on your hand, uh, on your part, for that customer security. And that's where the idea of three-legged auth comes into play. And this is a pretty common implementation across uh, OAuth services in general. This is the idea that in your client app, you have the client ID, and then on, in your server, you're holding on to the secret that was generated. And from your application, you initiate the authentication process. You load up the Uber login service in a web view. You click authorize, the user clicks authorize on the scopes. And instead of, instead of returning an access token directly, uh, we return an authorization code. That authorization code is then in the third party client, mobile client. They need to hand that up to their server. The server then uses the client secret that only is contained on the server, not in the, the mobile app, uh, as well as the authorization code to exchange that with our API for a valid privileged access token. Now the server has that, they can return that back to the client, and the client can use that privileged access token to make, uh, in, can make a, authenticated API requests against the privileged endpoints. Uh, as you can see, this is a bit more of an implementation. You have to have a, uh, the mobile app and the server running. Uh, I think the implementation here is a little off-putting to a lot of people. And that's where uh, some apps have improved on this a lot. You know, you have this idea of single sign-on or native sign-on. This idea, uh, you would have seen it in Facebook and Twitter and a lot of different apps. The idea is that instead of having to implement the server yourself for the secret, you uh, can rely on the first party Uber app on the device to guarantee that that is uh, a valid signed user. In this example, you have the third party app with the client ID, and it talks to the installed Uber app. The Uber app then loads the web view, or uh, some apps load native views. Uh, once that access authorization is approved, uh, an access token is directly returned to the user. They can then use that to access the privileged API endpoints. There's a few ways that I've seen single sign-on built out before. Uh, I, I worked on it at Evernote, at Twitter, and at Uber. Uh, I've also contributed against the Facebook single sign-on SDK. The most straightforward approach is using uh, URIs directly. That's because uh, what this does is it allows uh, the third party app to start a URI that goes into the first party service, the Uber app in this case, and then on successful authentication, it is then, the Uber app then fires a redirect URI that the client app is registered to receive. Another approach that I've seen implemented is using uh, custom actions and then the client app using start activity for results, the uh, access being granted by the user, and then the app calling finish. Then the on activity result is called. They're, they parse out the, the bundle that has the authorization token that they expect. The Twitter app and SDK was actually built this way uh, to account for legacy clients that existed before the public SDK went out. A uh, third approach, similar to the second one, is to use the Android account manager. Uh, that's the idea that start activity for result is called, but you have some classes that you implement that are ordained by the system, and you have an authorization flow that happens, an access token is returned back in the on activity result. Uh, one of the downsides of this is that additional permissions are required, and on older versions of Android, where that still is problematic for auto updating, uh, that can be both problematic for the implementer, the provider, as well as the third party application that needs to add a permission just to get at the token. The Evernote SDK was actually built this way. Uh, and I'll dive into some reasons why here in a little bit. I think that using URIs and the callback URIs is, is probably the most standard approach at this point. 
it's, it's cross-platform. It works well on iOS and on Android. And there's actually an IEEE RFC out right now for it currently uh, called Native, Native Sign-On, I believe. Um, it's really showing that the industry is kind of standardizing on this approach. But I believe out of the box, it has a little higher security concern than just using the start activity for result in the other two that we talked about. Uh, and those should be mitigated through some of the app linking like we talked about earlier, where only one app can handle that scheme if it's installed. Um, setting the package when we're calling the URI uh, and using the package manager to query for the right fingerprints. And we'll dive into how to do both of those in a minute. Um, in a high-level approach, you know, we have the, the client app, and it, it calls, uh, it sets the data being this login service. It then calls start activity. Uh, the user completes the authorization flow. Uh, a redirect URL was configured by the third-party client. We have a developer dashboard where they enter that information. Um, Facebook has a similar developer dashboard. Um, you know, most services that you work with for this sort of thing will have that. Uh, on the completion of that, the Uber app fires that redirect URL out as an intent, and the third-party app is registered to handle that so we can parse out the access token. Now, as you can imagine, authenticating the user, uh, when we're authenticating the user, we should be thinking a lot about security. Uh, if we're not, then it's possible for a third-party agent, uh, especially a malicious app, to get in the middle of this flow and potentially trick the user into providing authentication information or getting it a valid access token such that they can create, uh, commit fraud on behalf of the user. Uh, what I, the first thing I would recommend is when you're using these intents, to explicitly set the package of the application that you know you're talking to. Uh, so in this example, not only do we set the, uh, the, data with the, the data with the deep link URI here, which would be, in our case, the login service, but we also explicitly set the package to the official package that's on the Play Store, com.ubercab. Uh, and I recommend doing this on both sides. So when the Uber app is performing the authorization before it communicates back to the third party client, uh, it would use the registered package from uh, the developer dashboard that we retrieved as, the, uh, as that party set this up and configured it uh, to communicate backwards. That would help mitigate a malicious client from calling uh, into it and uh, potentially overwriting the redirect URI that the valid third party had set. Another security feature that I'd recommend implementing is to verify the public fingerprint coming from the, the signature in the APK, and this should be done on both sides. Um, the public fingerprint can be uh, obtained pretty easily using key tool. Uh, then in the client application, they should be explicitly setting that, or explicitly checking that uh, the app that they're talking to, in this case, com.ubercab, is signed as they expect. And if it's not, then we can throw an error or we can return false and you know, abort, abort the flow, you know, tell the user that, that we can't complete the authorization for some reason. Um, on the Uber side, we should be doing the same thing with the client app. So when they register their app with our developer dashboard, they provide their public fingerprint and we will only talk back to an application that has their pu public fingerprint from their key store. Now an interesting caveat to this is that in older versions of Android, um, you, there was potentially an exploit where you have this uh, chain of certificates that comes from the key store, and you used the public uh, certificate that was valid. Like, let's say I pulled down Google Maps, I pulled out the public fingerprint, and then I wrote up a little hacky little Python script that uh, created a new trust chain where I specified that the Google Maps public cert was the signer of my uh, developer key store, or developer cert. Now I sign an APK with that, and I install that on the device. It's a malicious APK. It has a trust chain with two certificates. One of those certificates is the Google Maps public certificate with no other certificates leading up to the root verification. And the other is my malicious developer certificate. Now, a common implementation that I've seen is uh, you would call dot signatures, you'd query the package manager, and it would return this list of all the certificates. And then the developer would say, do any of them match the public fingerprint that I expect? Now, if the exploit was uh, being used that I just described, one of them would match the public fingerprint from Google Maps. And so this would then pass. Uh, 
Google has fixed that in later versions of Android. I believe in 14 and above, it's resolved. And Google Play Services also uh, has some security fixes in place for this. But on older devices, uh, especially non-Google Play devices, like uh, devices in emerging markets, in China, uh, the Kindle, other things like that, there's still potential for this exploit, exploit in various places. So an easy way to resolve that is to instead make sure every single certificate in the trust chain matches the signature that you expect. And if any of them do not match, then you know that you're in a, in a situation like this. Uh, I want to move on to another project that I worked on when I was working on developer platforms, and that's the Evernote app. Uh, we did a big integration with Samsung to support uh, at the S-Note app. Uh, there were a few high-level requirements for this project uh, that we needed to, to meet. Uh, the first is that the S-Note notes must be browsable in the main Evernote app along with all the other first-party content that was created. Uh, the S-Note app S-Note notes must open directly into the S-Note application when they were clicked on. And upon uh, finishing working with those notes in the S-Note application, the user was returned back to Evernote. And S-Note could, on its own, create content directly to the Evernote app on the device and sync content asynchronously against the uh, Evernote web service using the, device, using the application installed. So let's go over a little bit about what that entailed a little bit more, and then I'll dive into some of the components and implementations we used to solve that. Um, the first thing that we needed was to be able to get one or more notes from the Evernote app to the third-party client, S-Note. And we also needed a UI action that represented starting the list view explicitly in the Evernote app. We needed the ability to create or update already existing notes. And we needed the ability to delete notes based on the user's feedback in the S-Note app. Uh, we also needed to read account information from Evernote into the S-Note app. Uh, we needed to discover logged in state and syncing preferences and kick off that sync between Evernote and its web service. And lastly, we needed to get specific preferences to the Evernote implementation, like the available space left in the user's account so that, so that S-Note could show the right user experience uh, when an error happened, like um, a note couldn't be created because its file size exceeded what the user's quota was left for the month. Uh, we could take advantage of the many standard Android components to solve these requirements. Uh, so I'll, I'll, we'll kind of dive into what those are. The first that we used a lot were intents. So we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive into the specific parts of that that made sense. Uh, we also used the content provider to solve uh, for more of the larger sets of data and for batch content. Uh, we used the account manager to provide some of the uh, authentication information uh, and uh, give a better user experience for the customers moving back and forth between the two. We uh, used the sync adapter as well, and that was used to optimize some of the network connectivity between the Evernote app and its web service, as well as to expose the ability that, for that to be kicked off and uh, get the syncing information directly in the S-Node app. Lastly, we had a bit of custom inter-process communication that we needed uh, for additional metadata back and forth. Uh, so after we're talking about each one of these in the project, uh, I'll kind of talk about how we can cover some of the security and privacy concerns that you may think would exist in a project like this as well with some custom permissions. Uh, intents are one of the first components that new Android engineers learn about when they're, when they're learning Android. And that's for good reason. Uh, they're this crucial uh, way of communicating between activities, between uh, different applications even. And it can contain a bundle, you know, just a, a key value store with various information. And it allows one component to provide data to another. Uh, they do they're not super efficient for large payload sizes, though. I believe that the developer docs recommend that you submit no more than one megabyte in a bundle across an intent. Um, so they wouldn't necessarily be great for sending a lot, of, a lot of these notes through. Fortunately, they have the set URI method where you can provide a URI. Uh, we'll walk through an example of how we can use that URI to get larger sets of data uh, out of a content provider. Uh, they're not really great for multiple operations as well. Um, if you had a lot of notes that needed to be created, even if we split it up across broadcasting multiple intents, 
that broadcasting system is running on the main thread, um, so that could definitely cause some ANRs. And a requirement while we were building this partner integration was that the user could have already been using SNote, have a lot of content, and then enable the integration, which all of a sudden needs to sync a lot of data to the account. So we needed to account for that. Uh, Intents will also allow you to create custom actions and expose those. And by going a step further, we could kind of use these to create a consistent API with sets of actions so that that became more familiar with the, to developers coming from something like RESTful APIs. Now, you can start providing more uh, functionality from your app to another app right out of the box by implementing some of the standard actions for intents. And these are commonly used for things like sharing, a sharing an image from one app to another. Uh, the first action that's commonly used is the send action. And that is explicitly designed for you to send one piece of data from an app to another. The send multiples, very similar. Uh, you probably have seen this when you've been in the photo gallery and you've picked multiple images to share to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Uh, the view action is quite similar to send in, in concept, but they're designed for two different purposes, whereas send is sharing something out. View is designed when your app shouldn't be handling looking at the file. For example, maybe uh, your app can't handle viewing the mind type of a PDF, but the user has a, a PDF viewer installed. It can register to show that MIME type. And on interacting with the PDF from your application, your, the user could be sent to this third party PDF reader. Um, lastly is the edit action, which is quite similar to view, but it's more for the concept of you have another application on the device that can edit a file and return it back to the calling application, back to the sending application. I think that in the edit action is uh, a lot more interesting than the others, just because it has a lot of caveats that, that go along with it. And we needed to use the edit quite a bit for some of the content that existed in a note. When we had a note with just a single attached S note, um, the user needed to be able to edit that and be returned straight back into the app. Uh, we also use this for the sketch annotations that you guys may have been familiar with if you're an, a user of the product, as well as to implement uh, common other edits for MIME types. Like if you had a, a doc attached to a note and you wanted to edit that in Microsoft Office and then be returned back to Evernote when you're done. Uh, when we create our intent, we just set the MIME type for the file so that the applications installed on the device that know how to handle that can. And then we uh, specify the data URI that we have that we can provide from a content provider. And once we've built that out, we call start activity for result. And we expect it, the, calling, the sending app to uh, provide a status to us when they're done. On the receiver side, we implement an intent filter on the activity to handle editing for that specific MIME type. And it'll allow our app to be picked by the user um, from the intent filter. Then uh, we need code to read the incoming intents in this uh, third party application and, and match the parameters that we expect. You know, we can check the MIME type. We can see that this is an image. We can edit that. And when we're done, uh, we want to explicitly set the result to OK and provide an intent back with the information about it and then finish. Now, um, on the sender side, we're notified in the on activity result at that point. We can open up the intent, we can get the information from the get data, and then we can progress forward with the flow. But there's a lot of caveats that kind of come with that basic integration from send to receive and back to send. It's primarily due, primarily due to inconsistencies in how different apps implement this process. Uh, I really recommend that you don't send the original file to the third party application. You are providing the URI that the content provider is going to serve to a file. And there's a lot of edge cases with that. For example, uh, what if the user clicks cancel and after they had made some changes to that file directly? Now, that application may have written those changes, but when they click cancel, uh, it's going to call set result canceled and return back. But it's been editing the original file that you provided, assuming you, had, you gave it right access as well. And at this point, the user canceled the operation, but that third-party application wrote changes to the file. So you're back in your app, and they potentially didn't have any sort of undo operation that needed to be implemented. It won't really be clear to the user 
where that user experience broke down, and it'll just seem really janky, and uh, they'll be pissed that their, edit, their image uh, was edited when they hit cancel. Uh, I recommend that you instead copy the file, send a copy of the file along to the uh, editing application, and then uh, when you get the, that result back, prompting the user to confirm replacing that copy with the original. Uh, you can't always rely on the set result or the on activity result. There are certain activity flags that cause on activity result to be fired immediately. So we found if we wanted to maximize the ability to edit a file with a lot of different things on the, installed on the device, we needed code in our on resume to check if the file had been edited, if the user had been using it, and uh, potentially prompt the user to do that replacement. Uh, another strategy that uh, we'd worked with was using the content observer to watch for changes to the file. Uh, in the end, I think what worked best was uh, we just kept uh, an MD5, a checksum of the file, and if that was different, then we knew at least a change had happened, and then we could prompt the user uh, again so that they could confirm the edit of that or not. Uh, I talked about some of the standard actions that we could use to support things that are already on the device. Uh, however, when you're thinking about providing your app as a platform to other apps, um, you might want to have a lot more custom actions that you're using as APIs to use through the intents. And how we built this out, what I ended up liking was kind of thinking it like RESTful APIs, where you have these data models, like a note or a notebook, and then you have these standard intent actions that can be used that would be familiar to developers coming from multiple platforms. Now, there's no way to really discover these by default. So these have to be, uh, these, these have to be communicated through your developer docs so that the customers of your application have the sort of information that they would expect. Now, in this example, something like list is potentially going to show a UI element. It's going to you know, open up the app in the list view. View is going to do similar. New is going to open up a composer. But then you look at create and update and delete in a few of these, and these can be you know, asynchronous operations. Like create expects that it would have a bundle with all the required data, and it would immediately create the content and then return back to the calling application. Uh, update and delete would do similar. Um, here's a, an example of how a caller could start uh, a new note with some pre-filled data, and this would end with the user being in a UI with just a couple things pre-filled. Um, now, I, I think that using these in this way works great for single pieces of information, for smaller pieces of information. But let's dig into the content provider so we can figure out how it would work with larger sets of data and batch, batch data. What is the content provider? Well, it's just a contract to consume and write data to your app. It's an interface that you would implement that's traditionally backed by SQLite. However, it's just this interface to be implemented so you could uh, implement this however you saw fit. This could be uh, Berkeley DB, it could be just writing things to disk, it could be in memory. Uh, I think we're, intents are great for small snippets of data. The content provider is designed to query and write much larger sets of data, um, so that you're not going to run into the same issues. But the implementer must define a unique authority, so there can only be one content provider with that authority per device. Um, so that's, that's going to kind of give you a tighter contract when you have an application dealing with it. Let's start with a few examples. Uh, we talked about the URI earlier in the case of deep linking. They're often used for the content provider as well. A common implementation of using them with content providers is to use content as the scheme to explicitly reference that. Uh, and then the authority here needs to be the explicit authority defined by the content provider. If you tried to install an app that had a content provider that wasn't unique, it would actually fail APK installation. Um, here we have the data model users, and we have an ID, first user in the table, that we want to look up. So we've gone through a bit of the basics of like what and the fundamentals of what the content provider is. Let's see an example serving and consuming the data. Uh, here we provide the query method in the content provider, so we can match the URI to the table that we have. And if that ID exists, we can append that. And then we can apply the remaining methods in the query builder and return a cursor so that the calling application can use that cursor to look at the data that we may have. Once we've built the content provider up, we have to be able to access that data. And so we'll use the content resolver to uh, assemble that 
and, and hit the content provider that may exist in your own application uh, if you, you know, are using that as a tightly defined SQL contract. But uh, I think a better use of this is often in a, another application that they have exported their content provider so that you can use the content resolver to query that. Uh, just like we can serve SQLite, you know, rows of, of text information out with this, we can also serve files directly from disk. And this is pretty crucial to the edit implementation that I talked about earlier. And I think that's a little more interesting. So uh, we'll, we'll dive into that. So we do have traditional methods like query and insert, but um, this is the open file method that's implemented in the content provider. It returns a parcel file descriptor, which is, uh, and this method is similar to the open assets file, which is another interface in the content provider, but that's specifically designed to return subsets of a file. Uh, so that would be great for returning resources out of an APK where the APK is the zip and you want to return one resource, so that's technically a subsection of the file. Whereas open file in this example would be uh, a, a, an independent file that exists on disk or you know, a, a temp file that you maybe potentially create from memory <laughs> or from a network request. Now, uh, this is, this one here uh, is setting the, the mode so that it's read only. So this actually would need to be changed to read write if we wanted to use this in the edit example. What we do is we return the parcel file, parcel file descriptor. We can use that parcel file descriptor then to get out a file descriptor. Once we have the file descriptor, we can then use that to get the input streams, the output streams, and there's even uh, like the bitmap factory has interfaces to deal with the file descriptor directly. So a third-party application can query your content provider with a URI, often you're handing to them in the set data method of an intent, and then they get that file descriptor back. They can then read, write, uh, do all the operations that they want on that. So I'm gonna move on to another component now that we needed for the implementation, and that was the account manager. Uh, it's a system component that allows you to kind of group accounts, show them in one place to the user. That provides a little bit of a better uh, user experience in my mind. Uh, it makes it also some potentially accessible and discover, discoverable to other applications that are installed on the device if they have the right permissions, which was needed for the S-Note integration. And it provides helper methods for getting out tokens and initiating the login flow and some other things that might be kind of common. It also has error states like access denied that you would need to implement. And we'll dive into that implementation in a minute. And it, it, in the end, it kind of provides a consistency to the end user. Uh, they have one place where they can go and they can see the accounts that they have authenticated on their device. If they click the add account from here, often accounts, uh, often applications register that sign up or sign in flow and that can be activated from here as well. How would we, in our application, add our account here to be used by the user? Well, we need to extend two classes. The first is the abstract account authenticator, which is just a service that the account manager communicates with. And the second is the account authenticator activity, which is an activity that you would create to handle the login and the sign up flow. Here's a great diagram uh, from the Android developer docs directly. Kind of describes the flow of using account authentication using the account manager. We, the process begins by trying to get out an account token. And if there's a success to that, then the callback uh, will contain a key intent that we can use to get the information out of the bundle that's handed back. Uh, and, or it has information on how to start the authenticator activity so that the user can sign in or sign up as well. And if an error condition happens, that's reported back as well. So let's cover a few important implementations of those two classes that I talked about. Add account is one of the methods that we would be forced to implement. And it's, uh, it's what happens when a user wants to add an account for your application. They click the add account from the account manager directly. You'd want to return a bundle with information on how to start your authentication activity so that the system can call that and start it. Uh, that's, the get auth token is another method that we would need to implement. And this is what's called when one application wants to get authorization to your token uh, for them to use. So like the S-Node app would call get auth token to the Evernote app. It's kind of the meat of our implementation for us to walk through. 
we would extract, uh, we, a simple implementation kind of naive is we can extract the username and password from the account manager. Uh, more than likely you have an auth token here instead, but for simplicity's sake we'll use that. And then we try to use that to request a token from the server. We'd say, hey Evernote server, uh, here's, uh, I'm authenticated, please give me a new OAuth token for this application that's trying to access. If our code's successful, then uh, we can return that in a bundle to the calling application. But if it's not, then we need to create an intent that describes the error that can be followed to go into the login activity, the authenticator activity. If we're explicitly signing in through the organic flow of our application, then we also need to explicitly add an account to the account manager once our flow is done. Um, so we would need to add a username and an account type to the account manager through its own APIs. We also need to set the auth token that came down. And then we can populate an intent with all the extras to be read by the account manager and we can hand it over to that. And when we're done with that, if we're in the middle of that auth flow that we talked about before, then we could use the set account authenticator result method where we would provide that intent and then we could finish our activity and it would call back into SNote with this authentication information that came from the login flow. Um, the other uh, piece of, of Android component that we need to talk about to kind of finish some of the, the requirements here is the sync adapter. And it's a little more notorious to get working. It requires you to implement both a content provider and an account manager to use. Often people create a stubbed out content provider just to get access to the sync adapter. At a high level, it's a great efficient way for the platform to control syncing between the applications and web services. Uh, it, it's visible to the user when these syncs are happening so that they can understand their own privacy, uh, their own data usage. And the system, it, it already optimizes these a lot, right? So you have uh, a lot of wake up events where you have uh, these sync accounts that are kicked off and they'll run together to be a little more optimal. This reduces the time that the radio's on and doesn't have random alarm managers explicitly waking up the device at as many random periods of time. And it can be accessed with third party applications, which is what we needed explicitly for dealing with the Samsung integration. You can also explicitly kick off a sync for another application if you have the right permissions. And in addition to the interval scheduling, it's also a great way uh, to get network tickles and pushes from Firebase messaging uh, to kick off the syncs as well. To implement that sync adapter, uh, we just need a subclass, the abstract threaded sync adapter. And it's the, really the most important method of this, the, the most important method of this entire thing is the on-perform sync, which gets run. It begins the process. This is already running on a background thread, so we're not concerned about main thread at this point. In this example, we use the account manager to get out the account that we have logged in, and then we use that auth information to sync down some basic images and write those to disk in this naive implementation. Now, we would also need to create a service for the sync adapter to bind to, and since the, so that it runs in the same process as the main application, and that gives our sync adapter access to resources and that account information. Lastly, we would need to create a, metada a metadata file. And there's some additional flags that we can set on this, like allow parallel syncs. That would be useful for if you had multiple accounts that existed in the account manager. You wanted to kick off parallel syncs for each one of those. Once we have that all defined, we would add that information to our Android manifest. We would create an intent filter. We'd add the metadata explicitly and we'd add the service that we needed as well. So now that we've got that all working, how often should we run the syncs for the sync adapter? Assuming we wanted polling every hour on the hour, which is quite ambitious, and your app probably doesn't need to sync data that often. Um, but let's assume we did for this example. You'd probably implement something like this, add periodic sync. Um, but you'd deploy this, and if your app has millions of users, your Ops people may come to you very angry a little bit later on and say, hey, uh, why are we getting these giant spikes in traffic on the hour? So you're DDoSing yourself at this point. Um, you're like, hey, the content provider, or the sync adapter, I thought it was supposed to be smart about syncing these. Why is this going on? Well, 
it turns out that uh, many of the carriers send down heartbeats for the devices. Those often run on the hour. And so the Android device says, hey, I'm being woken up on the hour by AT&T, by Verizon, whatever. And I just so happen to have a content provider or a sync adapter that says, hey, I need a sync every hour. Now's a good time to let them go download a bunch of content or do whatever they need to do. So a better approach is to randomize that just a little bit. So instead of saying we wanted every hour explicitly, we would add a little bit of jitter to that. So we have here a random uh, five minutes that we add to this. And now over time, we would get a much more natural distribution of that. Another way uh, for us to have inter-process communication that we used was to implement uh, AIDLs, or Android Interface Definition Languages. And that just kind of binds to a standard Android service. It's like an interface, um, but it uses an AIDL extension. And then you generate code from that AIDL extension. Uh, you implement that on both sides with a concrete implementation. And then your processes can talk to each other. Uh, it allows you to call API methods directly across. But the uh, sender and receiver both need the same concrete implementations. And the classes moving back and forth need to be parcelable. So let's go over a sample implementation of that. Let's say we had a, a service that could pass messages between two processes. We define the AIDL file uh, with the methods we want to use. Uh, and the type support here includes primitives as well as parsable classes for these. And then we'd implement the auto-generated stub from the AIDL here. Uh, and the implementation we want to do is just logging the message for the test. And now we need to expose the remote service by returning the binder and the onbind method so that any consumer who attaches the receive, re receives the implementation that we designed. And the service will cache the result of onbind. So if you weren't quite ready and you returned null from this, uh, you're never going to be able to bind to this after that, uh, during that process lifecycle. Finally, we can consume the re remote service in another app by setting up a service connection. It receives callbacks for when the connected and disconnected states happen. Uh, but you need to manage all the binding and unbinding based on the lifecycle, like our on resume and on pause. What's funny about on service disconnected is it's only called when the remote service has an unexpected exception. So you need to explicitly uh, null that out when that happens or when you're unbinding. Or else you could get into an invalid state. So we've talked about a lot of permission or a lot of features, but we haven't talked a lot about the uh, privacy concerns or security. So I want to walk you through a little bit of using permissions with these sort of inner, inner process components. Uh, the first goal of permissions in general is to kind of inform the user of what we want to be doing. Uh, we list sensitive operations that the application can perform, and the user can make a conscious decision. But we know how rational users may or may not be, and how often they read these sort of things as well. So the other idea that we want to be doing here is we also want to be mitigating the exploits that could potentially happen if an app is compromised by not giving it access to things that it may not necessarily need or by uh, putting certain controls in place. So Android permissions fall into four levels. They have normal permissions that can't really impart real harm to the user. They can change the wallpaper, for example. Uh, and while apps need to request them, normal permissions are granted automatically. Dangerous permissions can impact real harm. They could call a phone number. They could send an SMS. They could get the address book. They could do things like that. And the apps need to request these with user confirmation. Signature permissions are granted automatically to apps that are signed with the same key store. So potentially, you had multiple apps uh, in a suite of apps. Uh, they could talk to each other uh, using these custom permissions that were signature defined. Uh, but other apps that were signed with a different key store would not be able to use those. And lastly, you have signature or uh, sorry, you have signature or system, and signature or system is very similar to signature, but it also allows system apps to access these as well. And this is designed explicitly for OEM use. Android gives us the ability to declare our own permissions as well uh, to secure the objects we've been talking about today. So they must be provided by the recipient app and declared on the calling app to grant permission. Uh, they. Calling these services that specify a requirement without acquiring the permission would result in a security exception. And they can be checked programmatically in Java, or they can be explicitly set in XML via some of the components that we defined. Here we can look at how to enforce that a little bit. 
we can call the check calling permission method on a context to determine if the calling application was granted the permission required. And if it wasn't, then we could throw an exception here. And a caveat to note is that it's easy to leak permissions on the check calling yourself permission because it uh, uses your own application's uh, permissions as well if you had defined your own custom permission. And if we instead wanted to enforce this permission in XML, we could just define that here with the read permission and the write permission, uh, and that's going to manage it for us. Um, if they were on Marshmallow and up, we still need to prompt the user to, to, for that to be accepted as well. All the other components that we talked about today offer similar ways to flag that down in the XML, but I'm only going to kind of show this quick example of doing it with the content provider. Uh, so at the beginning of this, we talked about all the project requirements, so I'm going to quickly show what we use to solve each one of these. For the Git notes, we use both intents and content providers depending on the size. Uh, for the list, we just had an intent that started the UI. For create, up, create and update notes and delete notes, we could also use the uh, intent and content provider again based on if it was a single note or, con or a batch of notes. For the account syncing info, we could use the account manager and the sync adapter. And then for getting the preference information, we could use the content provider to get at things as well as the bound services to get at explicit objects. Um, so these are pretty rewarding systems to build out. They're a lot of fun building for other developers, but they can be really challenging to debug. Uh, in my experience, many of, the many of the integrations are device specific, like building against an OEM camera. It's a common implementation. So setting debug points and, and switching between processes is pretty difficult, and it can become troublesome. And so with that challenge, I'd recommend having really good logging during this to try to figure out what's going on. And setting up automated tests with, um, with mock APIs, mock integrations, to kind of walk through those flows. And while these can feel like magic when they work well, they can cause a lot of user frustration when they break down. And since set, things like set result may not necessarily uh, always be appropriately used on edit, uh, I think that it's pretty appropriate to have a pretty strong line of communication with your user on what's going on, what the communication is happening. Uh, even consider having something like a beta channel to use when testing some of these so you can get early feedback on your integrations. And lastly, uh, rely on the great tools that already exist for getting user feedback from this sort of stuff. Uh, like account for like mass data using things like Crashlytics and Analytics, but also think about explicitly seeking feedback on these sort of implementations as well. Uh, I hope you guys had some great takeaways from my talks. I'm, a, I'm pretty excited to see more apps integrate with each other in the ecosystem. I think that's a pretty unique and powerful piece of Android, uh, and I don't think as many apps do it as, as I would like. Um, so I'll be excited about that. I think I'm a couple minutes over time, so I don't really have time for questions, but I'll be around, and if you guys want to talk about dev platforms and Android integrations, I'd be happy to chat. Thanks. Mm -hmm.